It was May of 1932. It's a spectacle unparalleled in the history of the country. And something was very wrong in the land of plenty. A day of bloodshed and riot. There were those of us who felt that America was teetering on the brink of revolution. For three years, the Great Depression had tormented Americans. Now, 20,000 Army veterans and their families came pouring into Washington to find out what the government was going to do about it. They were bearded, they were ragged, they were desperate. You could see it in their eyes. They'd been promised a bonus for their service in World War I, but it was not due to be paid until 1945. The desperate veterans wanted their money now. They were called the Bonus Army. On July 28th, the Bonus Army came to blows with Washington police. Shots were fired. President Herbert Hoover barricaded himself in the White House and called out the troops. The soldiers have orders to burn down the unsanitary and illegal camp. And the roaring flames sound the death knell to the fantastic Bonus Army. When the smoke cleared, two veterans and an infant were dead. It was absolutely shameful. The sacrifice of the young American boys left such an impression on me, I have never forgotten it. They were just trying to feed their families. Millions of Americans could no longer provide for their families. With nowhere to turn for help, they were angry and they were approaching their breaking point. Three years into the Depression, the American system was in grave danger. Unless it could change and change quickly, it might not survive. Bad times had arrived without warning. After a decade of expanding prosperity, almost overnight, the Wall Street crash of 1929 shattered America's confidence in its economy. I was 11 years old, but how well I remember it. It was like the skies had grown dark, thunder, and all of a sudden, faces were tragic, and people were walking around in the hallways of our building and in the streets with, with inquiring eyes and saying, has it happened to you? Has it happened to us? What is happening? The Living Telegrams at that time. And pretty soon, you could feel a horror. Behind the door, you was knocking. When you knock on the door, when the voice come out, yell, who, who is it, who is it? I say, I have a telegram. Well, slide it under the door, slide it under, or go away. Get away from me, get away from me. The collapse of the New York Stock Exchange in 1929 was only the most visible sign of a massive economic crisis. A crisis that spread quickly from Wall Street to Main Street. Miriam Johnson was living in California when the Great Depression arrived at her house. I was 11 when the crash came. My father at that time, along with a, father, a few friends, owned a small grocery store. One day he came home and, and he laid two dollars on the table in the kitchen. And he said, no more store. Everything is gone. And that was the end. For us, it was the end. Every day produced more bankruptcies, more layoffs, 
more people with less money in their pockets. Even U.S. Steel, a symbol of American industrial might since the turn of the century, was brought to its knees. In three years, the entire full-time payroll was laid off. 225,000 workers. The, the Depression hit this country all over. It hit the farm areas, it hit the cities. We were just there, out of work and out of food. Uh, and everybody was baffled. You know, nobody had ever had that experience before. I had been saving for maybe five, six years, a piggy bank, money in a piggy bank. Nickels, pennies, dimes the most. It turns out that I was the only one in the family that had any money. Because one day I came home and I grabbed hold of my piggy bank just to give it a shake and there was nothing in it. My mother was looking at me and she said, your father borrowed the money. He has to go out to look for work and he needed money to go downtown. came home and I didn't say anything but my eyes face was swollen with tears my eyes were blinking with tears and my father took me in his arms and he said I'm sorry I had to have money but it's a loan I'll pay it back to you he never did he never did My family had exhausted all its credit with the local merchants. And uh, on one occasion, uh, my father came home and asked what was for dinner that night. And uh, my mother said, there's nothing. Uh, how, how, how could that, that be? How could there be nothing? It was one of the few times in my life that I was fearful for myself. Fearful of losing what little they had left, people rushed to the banks to withdraw their savings. But the banks, too, were short of cash. One year after the crash, 800 of them had failed. Nine million savings accounts were wiped out. There was a janitor called George Gellies, who had $1,000 in the Bank of the United States. It had taken Gellies 40 years to save a thousand dollars. After spending two nights and two days in the pouring rain outside this shuttered, locked bank, beating, literally beating on the walls with his hands in frustration, he realized he was never going to see 10 cents of his money. And he went back to the basement where he lived and he hanged himself in despair. That's what bank failures did. They crushed tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of ordinary people like George Gallies. With their savings gone and layoffs increasing, people were forced to sell their cars, their furniture, their wedding rings. Before long, half the country's home mortgages were in default families across America found themselves facing eviction. I remember my brother and I and my mother just couldn't stand to see it happen. So we left my father there to face the auctioneers. Then we came home that evening and we met my father who told us, yes, the house was sold. It was gone. And everything that we had had was no longer ours. The land was gone, the house was gone, and we had 30 days in which time to move out. And my mother sat on the side of the bed and cried. It was the first time I'd ever seen her cry. I'll never forget that moment. That's how our family was affected, and we were not unique. 
You know what hurt me most about it was the look of pain on my mother's and father's face. I couldn't bear to look at them, to look, to look at their misery, to look at their disgrace. They felt they had only themselves to blame. This was a different generation. This was a generation that had grown up with the old faith, the faith in self-reliance, that people had to stand on their own two feet. They didn't say the government has failed me. They said, I'm to blame. I failed in this American system of ours. It's my fault. One year after the crash, four million American families were without any means of support. Worse, they didn't know how to ask for help. And their government didn't know how to provide it. In 1930, the American people had almost no sense of the national government. Uh, there was the post office. Occasionally, you'd see a soldier on the street. The national government had very little direct impact on the lives of, of ordinary Americans. There were no, uh, no parachutes in those days. There was no Social Security, no uh, uh, unemployment insurance, no nothing. You just were on your own. By 1931, hard times seemed to be everywhere. But if you could still spare a dime, you could slip into a glamorous world where the Roaring Twenties had never ended. You could go to the Grand Lake Theater, uh, hear Horace Height and his orchestra play for half an hour. Then they'd have the movie tone news. And then they'd have the feature story. And then they would have Bugs Bunny or the equivalent comic and then they'd have the second feature. By that time, the orchestra was getting ready to play again. So you could spend about six or seven hours for 15 cents. There was no television, there was only radio. So this visual escape into a dark theater, you could literally uh, forget your troubles and get happy. Many people try to dance their troubles away off into the carefree, irresistible rhythms of a new generation of jazz music that was sweeping the country. Swing. Swing it, honey child. Susie Q's going to town and how. Now meet Richard Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Many more were transfixed by the gripping dramas of radio. During the Depression, the radio was the one appliance people could not live without. We used to watch the radio. It was like television on television. There was the shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> Turn off the lights. <laughs> we're going to clean them out today. You didn't know that they were standing on a stage reading from scripts. You just thought they were doing it. All right, boys, let's hit out. What I liked most was to go into my room and turn off all the lights. I didn't want any interference and just listen to it. My father thought I was a little weird, and he'd always come in and turn the lights on and say, what's wrong with you? And I said, nothing's wrong with me. This is really wonderful, a great way to listen to it. But sooner or later, people had to turn the radio off. They had to leave the movie theater. And when they did, the depression was still there, waiting. It advanced upon the farmers of the South and Midwest in terrifying storms of dry dust. It was one of the worst droughts in American history. The land itself was blowing away. <laughs> 